I think with hindsight, as I've grown up, I didn't realise at the time when I was a child, uh, growing up in the 70s, but I think now looking back, you can see through the history, of certainly film, that working class people had fulfilled this function, a bit like an updated version of Shakespeare's rude mechanicals, really. They were the, essentially in a comedic role. I mean, we, and we often did that ourselves. We can't blame the establishment entirely for that. We're, we're, we are making this interview, recording this interview in Manchester. Manchester had its own studio system called Jollywood, which made fairly silly, light-hearted comedies for working people, in which working class people got up to all kinds of silly japes. And then through a, a history of British cinema, when working class people are, are portrayed, it tends to be either as um, comic relief, they're either silly arses, uh, silly arses that sometimes get one over on the boss, such as George Formby and Gracie Fields. So they sometimes get one over on the establishment or the bourgeois figures, but it's essentially through being a wise cracking fool. Uh, it isn't through being intelligent or accepting a kind of native intelligence, but it isn't through success in the, in the traditional ways. It's through sort of getting one over on people in the way that um, working class people and working class culture often prizes. Um, or there was this salt of the earth idea, and that even runs through the Ealing comedies as well, you know, the, the idea, the essentially decent but humble and honest working class person, but the idea that these people should have had an intellectual life a political life, a sexual life, was, was not really being explored until the British New Wave films. And I think that what was so revelatory about these new films is that, firstly, they're not by and large comic, Billy Liar is, but it's a new kind of fantasy comedy with its roots in reality. But it's taking these people and their lives and their interior lives and their struggles and their passions and it is treating them with absolute seriousness. Not as, uh, not as some silly kind of uh, 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 light-hearted comic relief, but as protagonists in their own dramas in just the same way that you had uh, Terence Rattigan saying, the well-made player, which these things came along and displaced. Suddenly, um, the, the passions and, and loves of these people are just as important. And I think this is absolutely true of a kind of loving, where you get essentially a, a very naturalistic portrait of two young people in a kind of difficult circumstance, being forced to make moral choices about what they do and who they sleep with and where they belong. This you know, could be Ibsen. This could be Ibsen, except suddenly you're out of the drawing rooms of Oslo and you're in the factories of Leeds and Manchester and, uh, and the terraced rows of Preston and Wigan. And I think that, to say there is absolutely no reason why we can't treat these people in their lives uh, as, as rich and as real and as lived as Hampstead or Islington, yeah, or, you know, the drawing rooms of Terence Rattigan's well-made plays, or those Norfolk country houses of Noel Coward. It suddenly said, this is, a, this is just as rich and real a world. It is not there as a bit of set decoration. And I think that was, that was completely new. The North that he, I grew up in, in the late 60s, early 70s and 80s, the North that the Smiths grew up in and Joy Division and New Order grew up in, to use some musical examples, was essentially not the North you have now, because the long tail of the Second World War was still around. You see it in A Taste of Honey and in A Kind of Loving, but even it's the north of the first Joy Division album, a north in decline that's never really recovered from the war and then the 70s industrial blight. So the BBC now has its headquarters in a glittering and futuristic media hub at Media City, which is fantastic. You would not have gone there 10 years ago. You would not have gone to that run-down dockside unless you were looking for trouble in whatever manner you wanted to find it. Um, and in the same way, th th you see those bomb clearance sites all through these films. Um, you know, now you can get a skinny decaf latte 24 hours a day on the streets of Salford. But it, that's a relatively new phenomenon. And that sense of a, of a dark, declining, but having said that, incredibly lyrical and beautiful North, I think, especially in a kind of loving Schlesinger's eye and his DP's eye for the, the poetry of that twilight world of the wintry North is amazing. But it was, but, but it, it was a long time. It was the mid-1990s, I think, before this new North emerged. So the North I grew up in, even though it was in the 1970s, wasn't that dissimilar from the North of a kind of loving. When I see a kind of loving or taste of honey, I see really the streets I 
grew up in. Uh, monochrome, crowded, uh, kind of twilight, kind of crepuscular. Maybe of all the British New Wave movies, the one that I think is most lyrical and most poetic in its visual sense about the North, the industrial North, is a kind of loving. And I think that is a testament to maybe John Schlesinger's genius, because nothing in his, in his makeup would give him an actual kinship with the landscape of the North, from, a, I think, a middle-class Jewish family in London, uh, went to Balliol College, and uh, while I'm not saying anything detrimental about any of these things, I'm saying it would not ne necessarily make you think it's someone who's grown up, you know, like Ted Hughes or whatever, surrounded by this landscape, and could see the poetry in it. But he clearly could, and he brings that out so beautifully. In, there's so many scenes in the film that could, in lesser hands, simply become caricatures of the grimness of the North. But when, for instance, Vic's just got Ingrid to agree to a date and he's elated and he's running down that street in a kind of northern twilight and the two young women see him run past and turn and laugh and look at him, it's so full of love and life uh, and, and possibilities, even in this what could look like a fairly murky industrial landscape. And there are several scenes that I absolutely think Schlesinger, is, uh, his genius comes out. Um, when in that very bleak looking stone shelter on the top of the hill on the moor, uh, Vic and Ingrid start to sort of pet and it drifts away from them. Not just in the sense of drifting decorously away to leave the rest to our imagination, but also it pans across the graffiti and the etched hearts and arrows and the initials of all the other young couples who've been there. And it's fantastic because it doesn't hammer the point home either way or what you're supposed to take from it. You just think, you're the latest in a long line of these people and there'll be more after you. And is that bad or is that good? Is that hopeless or is that warm? You tell me. You tell me. It is not didactic, that point at all. There's a wonderful scene that I think is almost humorous. I don't know if Schlesinger meant this, but there's a scene that I think comes come straight out of a modern adaptation of, of Jane Eyre or, or the Brontes, where there's a scene at the works dance this scene of prim formality that could be Regency Cheltenham or Bath in, in Jane Eyre's era, when the formation team are dancing and gavotting along, and on either side of them are the lads and the girls. There's the girls looking bored and listless but expectant, and the lads chafing up the bit of this terrible formality, and in the end, they go off and get a pint at the Red Lion. But I just love the idea that this, the, the dance and the whole social etiquette of it, captured in that world, is as, is as formal and choreographed as it would be, you know, in, 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 in the Brontes or Jane Eyre. There is one scene, the bleakest scene in it maybe, is after uh, um, Vic and Ingrid have made love for the first time, although in the circumstances that is probably a, that is probably a, a rather romantic way of putting it. I've had sex for the first time. And we've, we've, we've left the room, of course, but we come back and we see this scene and there's a, there's a sort of mise-en-scene, there's a sort of framed picture that could come straight out of Edvard Munch from the Scandinavian school of all human beings' sexual relations will end in misery and, and desolation. There's this desolate scene with the two of them slumped and crushed and whatever it is that's happened or not happened, it's not gone well. Whatever, uh, you know, whatever sense of, of desolation has come over them and for whatever, it's just all there in their faces and in the hunched way that Ingrid is and in the crushed way that Vic is smoking his cigarette. It is such, such a bleak and powerful scene. Sex and class are the two big engines that drive the, the narratives of these films, I think, and the, and the, 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 the sort of turbine of the, of the energy of the movies, and particularly sex. Um, sex in film and in drama had often been treated, I think, before this as a, as a preserve of the middle classes. Only the middle classes committed adultery. Only the middle classes had adventurous sexual lives in the sense of had affairs, had romances, were caught in you know, twin passions, were, were victims of, of lust or love or whatever. And working people, basically, there's all a bit of this kind of lusty, you know, farmhands sort of getting it on in hayricks and stuff like that. But again, it's essentially silly and bawdy, and it's this idea of a romp, always bordering on the comedic. 
not in, in this, not in these movies, not particularly in the kind of loving where sex is the, the is the is what is what makes Vic it puts Vic in this terrible position where is he willing for the sake of his you know lust really for this pretty young woman is he going to compromise his whole life? She, by the same token, and I love about a kind of loving that it isn't a, 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 a match or male-centred world. There's a particular scene that brings this on beautifully. But you see her confronting these moral choices as well. Is she willing to give up her respectability and be a bad girl for the sake of getting this young man, if you want to put it like that, that, that she loves? And the idea that the idea that sex wasn't just a little bit of carnal frivolity, but in fact is right at the centre of their moral universe. And these people have sexual lives and sexual imaginations. It's never... To, to give Noel Coward his due, there is a precedent for it, maybe. You've seen Brief Encounter, where in Brief Encounter, the uh, Stanley Holloway as the, as the railway guard and in the cafe, you see suddenly in there that this lively working-class sexuality is, is put against Celia Johnston and Trevor Howard's rather prim, guilt-ridden sexuality. And that's the first stirrings, maybe, of it, even in Noel Coward's work. But in this, you get the feeling that these people are having sexual lives or having sexual thoughts or having sexual difficulties. And it isn't quite this kind of bucolic romping that, that lower-class sexuality had been presented as before. I think Stan Bass, though, is maybe the unsung genius of the British New Wave movement. In terms of writing, of course, we must not forget that the film is made by John Schlesinger. It's beautifully photographed. It's incredibly well acted, as are all the British New Wave films. But I, I, Barstow is one of my particular heroes of the movement in terms of its writing. Because I think if you contrast him with, say, say John Brain, uh, not Sheila Delaney. Sheila Delaney, absolute genius. But um, John Brain, it's very different. John Brain's Joel Ampton character in Room at the Top is Machiavellian, he's on the make, and you get the feeling that he embodies a little bit maybe of John Brain in wanting to get away from the North. This strand does run a little bit through these British New Wave films, through some of them anyway, that these angry young men, these highly sexualised young men, to get to the top, they're going to have to conform to a new, more bourgeois way of life. The boardroom, the g nice house, you know, they're going to have to do the trophy wife, they're going to have to do these kind of things. What I love about Stan Barstow and what I love about Kind of Loving, it's the most nuanced portrait of all of them. Compared to, say, Saturday Night Sunday Morning again, where you get Arthur Seaton, brilliantly played by Albert Finney, making quite a lot of speeches, there are very few speeches in Kind of Loving. It's quiet. There's a lot going on that's unspoken. And it is very finely nuanced in that rather than make any deep, rather than make any wild and angry political points, the conflict in the drama just plays itself out very quietly in these terrible, tender, awkward moments between Vic and Ingrid and the arguments in living rooms. But, it, but it's, not, it's not filmed against the kind of clatter of machinery and shouting the, the, and, and sort of sense of violence and physicality that maybe sat night and Sunday mornings. It's like a tone poem. It's like a tone poem, and you see that in Schlesinger's directing as well. The North has never looked more beautiful. I mean, it does th those wintry twilights across those northern landscapes, even the, the terraced houses and the rain on the cobbles. It is, it is that beautiful, lyrical world that it, maybe to some people it does look appallingly grim and, and appalling. But to me, it looks so full. Uh, it looks, it's filmed so tenderly and it looks so beautiful. And I think that's, that goes for a kind of loving as a whole. Very little happens in it. In terms of plot, even compared to A Taste of Honey, very little happens. Two people, spoiler alert, two people fall in love at work of a kind of loving uh, and one gets the other pregnant. That's about it. But within that whole moral world, as I said, that could be an Ibsen uh, 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 being played out there. I think it's lovely how Vic loves his mum and dad in this and how he goes back to them in that beautiful scene where he visits his sister and his mum and dad in turn and gets this tough love from all of them saying... You've made your own bed, son. You need to lie in it. You need to treat that poor, poor girl with some... It's great. I love, I love those scenes. Those three beautifully acted scenes with each of them, where each of them, in his kind of moral journey, basically says to him, grow up. I think British New Wave movies... To, w w w there's a twofold reason, I think, for the way, the, for the way that they disappeared. They became parodied. I think that the, an establishment, without sounding too chippy and northern, an establishment that had never quite enjoyed them, soon parodied them with that old, it's grim up north, and, you know, 
satires on kitchen sink realism in lots of, you know, comedy skits, you know. Um, and they became victims of their own success, I think, because where you can see the legacy of these films most clearly, obviously, is things like Coronation Street. I think they became so much a part of the, the cultural tropes of what was going on that they kind of weren't needed anymore because TV suddenly, Play for Today, Coronation Street, said, we're going to show you ordinary men and women and their loves and their desires and their troubles on screen every night on your telly. And you didn't need to go and see it on the pictures anymore. And I think that's part of it. It became the dominant, maybe, dramatic and cultural sort of template of the 1960s, really. I mean, you've got all that fancy stuff. You've got all that silly stuff like James Bond going on some elsewhere. But I think you were also going home and watching plays and dramas and soap operas and comedies even about your own world, if, if you came from this world like I do. So I think it became a victim of its own success. People were less willing, perhaps, to go to the pictures and watch it. It was only when watching The Kind of Loving Again the other night that I realised how many cultural tropes and cultural memes, if that's how you pronounce it, or memes, are taken, came from the British New Wave. The most obvious one is Coronation Street. But I'll know it's now become, I think, a pretty vacuous thing. It wasn't in the 1960s. It was, it was the British New Wave movies, chopped up small, made slightly digestible for popular entertainment and put on your telly. But you can see, you know, there's one being scenes in the early Carnage Street, Ken Barlow coming home from university, arguing about having the sauce bottle on the table. These class struggles on your telly on 7.30 on a Monday and Wednesday night, as was then, straight out of these northern, these British new wave movies. But I also saw lo so many things. I, I, when I was watching A Kind of Loving, I thought, Thora Hurd's character in A Kind of Loving is essentially the template for Hyacinth Bouquet. She's the prim, aspirational tight-arsed mother-in-law figure who's parodied in Keeping Up Appearances, although made into a much less, made into much more a figure of fun. She's, she herself is a victim too, I think, in Thora Hurd's unbelievably brilliant portrayal. When she turns on Vic and calls her that great, you feel, there's hardly any words in it, you filthy pig. It's just, it's so dripping with vitriol and shame and embarrassment. She's, a, you know, an incredible actress. Um, so, and I also thought, in, when, you, when you see Vic visit his older sister, his beloved older sister, you can tell, in her new house on the new estate, this is Terry going to his older sister and whatever happened to the likely lads. This is almost, Clement and Lafrenet, bless him, have almost taken that strand and put it in, in there. And I just thought so much that I took for granted about great northern comedy, drama, even music. You know, you might, could argue that the Beatles might not have even written Penny Lane without these films. I mean, the Beatles were great originators as well, and obviously part of, the, part of the engine that was driving stuff forward. But maybe seeing these films made the Beatles think, made Paul McCartney think, you know what? It doesn't all have to be writing about streets in London and Winchester Cathedral and Waterloo Sunset. I can write about a suburban street in Liverpool. I think it's hard to overestimate the, the continuing force these movies had, you know. If you listen to any of the great Smith songs, I mean, you know, Half of the first Smiths album is stolen wholesale, the lyrics from A Taste of Honey. So, I mean, a lot of the music, a lot of the music, a lot of the poetry, a lot of the literature, a lot of the films I love, you can see have their roots in this flowering in the, in the early 1960s.